quiet down, please? Okay. Hi, um, I'm Michaela Wozniak. I'm a fifth year, and I'm representing Posit as an e-board member up here. So hopefully all of you know this, but just to reiterate, Posit is a student-run digital multimedia platform for architecture students, which shares students' thoughts, writing, and design work on various digital platforms and curates content in a series of conversations related to architecture. These series of um, Posit panels, or Posit Live as we've been calling them, are in collaboration with the School of Architecture to present new faculty members. This um, Posit Live will be representing Professor Mitesh Dixit. And then as a um, current associate professor, Professor Gadlewski will be um, presenting with him as a panel. And our moderator. <laughs> And our moderator will be Professor uh, Sunin. So I'm going to introduce both of the professors. They'll do a quick presentation. We'll run through questions, and then we'll run through questions that you all submitted to posit through social media. So um, presenting first will be Professor Godlewski. <sighs> professor Godlewski has been an associate professor here at Syracuse Architecture since 2013. He is an architectural theorist, historian, practitioner, educator, and author. He received his B.Arch from Syracuse and his Ph.D in Master's of Science degrees in Architectural Theory and History from UC Berkeley. His work prior to Syracuse includes urban landscape development in Berlin with Mark Kosher Architect in Zurich, um, on the Big Dig in Boston, with Eisenman Architects in New York City, and in collaboration with KMA Architecture and Engineering in San Diego and SB Architects in San Francisco. Recently, Professor Godlewski has been awarded the best article of 2016 from the Plan Journal for his article, The Absurd Alibi, and best player by a scholar from the International Association of the Study of Traditional Environments Conference in Kuwait City for his article, Compound Constructions Real and Imagined. Professor Matesh Dixit is a new associate professor here at Syracuse Architecture. He is an architect, educator, public speaker, and author with interest in the intersection of design with government, policy, society, and culture. Before Syracuse, Professor Dixit taught at TU Delft in the Netherlands. In 2012, Professor Dixit founded Domain, an architecture and urbanism studio based in Rotterdam in New York City that does, not, that does work ranging from residential to public buildings. Domain operates in the contemporary art realm, often collaborating with contemporary artists, and does not work with the manifesto, but instead with a method that explores the very nature of questions and unpacking those questions. Prior to Domain, Professor Dixit worked as a project leader at OMA and led multiple international projects. Most recently, his work has been presented at the 2015 inaugural Chicago Architectural Biennale, 2014 Venice Architectural Biennale, and the Frank Center Museum in Orleans, France. Lastly, our moderator will be Professor Sunin who is a professor here at Syracuse University. He is a practicing architect, urban designer, and educator, noted for his extensive research in the history and theory of the urban form. He has previously taught in Princeton, the Architectural Association, Kingston and Greenwich Universities, and the University of Oregon School of Architecture and Allied Arts. He also has directed the Syracuse Architecture Florence Abroad Program in London and Florence. Thank you. Is this on? Awesome. Huh. Michaela, thank you. Um, and um, I also have to thank Posit. Um, so I, I also have to say that like this as a kind of student-run group is, uh, is quite an accomplishment. Because um, in your introduction, you mentioned that I went to school here. And we also had grand visions that we were going to have a, you know, we're going to have a document, we're going to have this like, journal, and it's going to be great. And like, a, we only got as far as like, picking the title. It was going to be called Document. I mean, great. And we, like, we, we designed the cover, and we had zero content. So like, it, uh, you need like, a critical mass to, to get that to work and a lot of hard work. So um, I mean, congratulations. Um, really good. Um, so I was going to, because this is about discourse um, today. Um, I was going to talk about how like, I use writing um, as a kind of architect, designer, um, scholar, but concentrate particularly on how I use it in, in, in kind of like three, three different identities. One is a kind of historian, uh, one is a theorist, and then another is an educator. 
Um, I mean, they, there's obvious overlaps between those, um, but 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 really, what I kind of want to get to is like what what writing um, allows me to do that, that I feel like other things um, don't allow me to do. Um, so I feel as though um, one thing writing does is it allows you to kind of have some some level of critical reflection on what what you're doing. So that's incredibly important. Um, it's not very easy, so it takes a, a lot of practice. Um, so I find that it, that it demands extreme clarity. So you, you can't just kind of gloss over or be impressionistic about it. You have to actually say, this is exactly what I'm doing. Um, and that, that's very, very hard. Um, and then I think particularly the kind of research part of it, I think that it, it, it kind of demands that you kind of build, build upon and adapt previous stuff. I mean, that's, that's architectural discourse, that there's, there's stuff out there and that, that you're contributing to it, um, and you are, you know, build, building something um, towards the towards the future. Um, I think uh, I've I've written in many different kind of forums, so um, articles, uh, books, um, blog entries, book reviews, um, and and most recently, I like a textbook, right? Um, so so all kinds of things, and I think each one of those allows me to kind of try out um, 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 different things. Um, so the first kind of category I was going to talk about was um, is a kind of historian. Um, so this was the article that you mentioned um, in the, the intro. Um, so this is a recent one that kind of grew out of my dissertation and really focuses on really the history of, of kind of spatial practices in southeastern Nigeria, right? Um, so the, the, the whole point of this one was to kind of go into a context, try to understand what's going on, uh, also try to... Um, really write a history that doesn't, um, it only exists in fragments right now. So it's like a, a really tough thing. So I had to kind of go to an archive, um, put together a whole bunch of different things. Um, and I think then the other thing about history is that it wasn't just a kind of thing in the past, but, but to link it to the kind of present day. So, so there was a lot of stuff in my kind of like field work of yes, going into archives and studying historical stuff, you know, reading stuff from, uh, you know, 17th century slave traders and, and things, right? Like, that's, that's weird, right? Uh, but then connected into con contemporary spatial practices. Um, the other thing that I had to try to do was try to reconstruct things that there's no visible record of. So, again, like reading, reading memoirs and text and, and converting that into kind of uh, the, you know, visual kind of architectural representation that, that we're used to. Um, so, so that was a that was a whole project. Um, the second territory would be uh, kind of architectural theory. So, so this um, this article um, was in the Plan Journal, and it was was part of their kind of theory series. Um, and the absurd alibi was really the kind of idea that that um, you know you have this dialectic at work. You know, you have autonomy and you have contingency. And really, the the position on this one was to kind of really critique. Uh, the, the idea of autonomy, that, that inevitably um, kind of architecture and architectural practices are inevitably like um, affected by contingent forces. Um, uh, Vitruvius made that kind of connection thousands of years ago, and I'm just kind of um, reinstating that. Um, it's interesting because it opens with an image of kind of, um, you know, from, from Eisenman Architects where I, where I work, you know, so it, it's not so much that it's like uh, anti-autonomy um, um, article. I think there's a, there's an in-between, uh, obviously there, um, and also like people think they read this and they're like, oh, you, why, why do you hate Peter Eisenman? You know, he's a very good guy. He's he's a good guy. Uh, um, and and one thing I actually did learn from his his practice is is his like real uh, desire and real um, demand that you have to write about your project. So he made that a whole a whole kind of uh, career. Um, the last part I was going to talk about was the, the pedagogy, or like, you know, teaching um, architecture as a kind of educator. Um, so, you know, obviously I teach like history and I teach theory, right? And, you know, there, there's lots of books you can go to, anthologies. Um, the, what I found problematic in a lot of these is somehow that particularly theory tended to come like from, purely from, Honestly, guys that look like me, you know, like white white guys from from Europe, white guys from um, the United States, and and that's what really occupies a lot of these anthologies. Um, 
what I tried to do was to create a kind of um, a, an anthology of architectural theory that, that speaks to the kind of larger demographics. So like it, it seemed weird to me to be kind of like going on and on about kind of Western, Western um, centric theory to, a, to an audience that, that, that really comes from a kind of global perspective. Um, so, you know, go to the university bookstore and, and, and pick that up. It's an amazing read. Um, the, the, the last uh, piece I was going to mention um, is, ties in for, to a couple reasons, because uh, I think that this uh, Art Daily piece is probably one of the ones that where I get the most feedback on and most people have honestly read, maybe because it's so short and it's free online. Um, but uh, it's, it's incredibly important to uh, pr both me and um, um, Professor Lori Brown who wrote this. Um, it's a kind of ongoing project to try to reimagine like how, how you, uh, you know, operate in studio culture, like the, what the strengths of that thing are, what the weaknesses of, our, what, of it are, and really the demand that, that we need to change it um, uh, moving forward. But the last thing I would say about this also is that it, I tend to, you know, when I write these things, yeah, you're like kind of building your resume and all that stuff, but I think that you, you forget, like, that it's not, does, doesn't just go into the ether, that, that I'm, I'm always surprised by like, you know, I'll go to reviews or um, to a conference somewhere and someone will be like, oh, I read your piece about Lagos, you know, and it's like, the, you know, that, at this point, the thing's like eight years old. Um, so so that's, the, that's the discourse thing again, where, where this stuff goes out there and, and it, it inhabits people's minds. And so like, you know, I read those things again and like I, I have different ideas about them now. Um, but but it, but this is this is one that really kind of um, uh, sparked a lot of interest and a lot of conversation. So I, I, I find that again is like why why I find writing so um, instructive. That's all I have to say. This is the last. One. Do I? Hello, hello. Can, is this working? Yeah. Okay. Is this, I'm sorry, this thing is super off-putting, I'm certain. It's like robotic, prosthetic, but I can't, I need my hand. So I'm not gonna Thank you, uh, professor, associate professor. Because I see you've got a promotion at this event. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, thank you, Pazin, as well. I think, I, I mean, to echo uh, Professor Golovsky, uh, can't say his last name. His um, comments, it's yeah, super impressive. I mean, I've, I've always think, yeah, students run the school, you know, students make the university. You choose an office or you choose a school because of the people that are there with you. I mean, and when I worked at OMA, it's like, yeah, it's a great run there, but the people that are there are what make it amazing. And so when I was looking for universities last year, I was in a fortunate position where I could sort of maybe have more than one option. But it was the students here and sort of my, his, my history with Syracuse students that made me very um, yeah, encouraged to come. And, so seeing it now and seeing what's happening is very, it's super inspiring for me. So thank you, thank you for having me. So mine's not gonna be nearly as um, accomplished as yours. <laughs> it's gonna be slightly autobiographical, and not some like, narcissistic way of self-promotion, but uh, maybe the, the events that brought me here in terms of architecture and writing and teaching. Because for me, I guess writing's the sort of focus here. I never wrote for anyone before. I always wrote for myself. I, I function from a position where I assume I'm an idiot, right? I think this is very important. Um, because then you always doubt yourself and you're sort of very critical of yourself. And it's not that, I, I mean, I don't think I'm an idiot. I mean, some think, yeah, I'm a complete idiot. But uh, so when people started recognizing the work, it was quite, yeah, I don't know, discouraging because you don't want to be, you don't want to influence you. But so anyways, I, my, about 2011, I'm showing Delft here because I think this is where my academic career began. And, and Delft for me was this, I told the interview last year, like Delft was my training for the big fight, and coming here was the big fight. And to have that six years there without, the, say, the responsibility of a proper position, et cetera, and that you can sort of disrupt things in a way, it was good. I mean, I couldn't do anything I did there here. I'd get fired. But so these images, I mean, I show these images, one, because I, they really, it was a really important part of my life. The students, again, the students at Delft were amazing. And I think the, the nice thing about Delft that we were all speaking a second language. And because of that, we were simply more clear they couldn't use this architectural jargon, which I just despise, and still something to get used to coming back to this country. I mean, I left this country for a specific reason, and those things still annoy me. Um, so again, the students. So my, I had a very fortunate uh, 
uh, dean that would hire me in Delft, and she asked me, because I was running this international competition studio, and we won three years in a row, we, schools like Etaha and uh, Penn and Berkeley, and uh, all these other schools. So she liked the method that I was using, uh, Professor uh, Dean Karen Lagos, like, super amazing person. It's important for anyone who ever helped you in life, write them every six months. Let them know how well you're doing. It's like one of the most amazing things for when a student uh, writes me. Usually it's when I owe them money. But like, <laughs> so I just encourage students, like, don't forget about us. Because it's like we're the kids at summer camp that don't leave. You know, so just, <laughs> just remember us. So there was, but the problem was that Delft was making these cutbacks on the government level, so they had to take three different chairs and combine them into one. And so I went back whack, and I looked at everything, and I said it would be simply impossible to integrate these three chairs. It would make like a Frankenstein-like composition. So I said, let's just kill the chairs. Let's just start over. Um, based on this experience in this international competition, my critique of working, my critique of, uh, of practice, if you will. So just to give you a sense of Delft and how kind of layered and kind of horrible it is. So these are all the different chairs of architecture. Uh, at Delft. Delft really thinks that architecture can be parsed this, to this sort of resolution, which I think is absurd. So, but the, even worse is, that was the, the thing we were doing. Um, this architecture was just a purple box within that. This, this is just in that purple box. And the rest of those departments have just as much compartmentalization vision of education, which I think is completely absurd. And one thing I learned working, that you can't, there is no such thing as a landscape architecture or urbanist or theorist, et cetera, et cetera. You have to do everything. An architect is, is a small A, right? You cannot design a building if you don't understand the urban context, if you don't do a functional diagram, if you don't look at porosity, et cetera, et cetera. I simply think it's impossible, and I will argue this with anybody. Um, so I went to each chair, because I was like, oh, colleagues, I'm going to talk to them. But no one really cared about the content. They were like, this, these are my, this is the word I use. Don't use this word. Yeah, so we eliminated essentially every architectural word possible. And so we're like, okay, what do we do? Um, and then in sort of this sort of Heidegger-like moment in time of being where he wanted to discuss the notion of self. But to do this, he had to sort of liberate the word because the word, the word is so historically loaded. So we're like, okay, let's just find a new, like so he used the sign, which is the verb of being, being in the world. So your being is through being, right? Your, your, your essence is defined through existence. So we saw this, again, as an opportunity then. We can just reject the language of architecture, purely focus on content, because no one really cared what we were teaching as long as we didn't use their branding. And um, so we came up with the two worst names we could think of, complex and projects. Also because then, in the way like the sign, it kind of liberates us. Everything is complex and everything's a project. And as long as you call it a project, you can ignore scale. Once you say it's an urban design, you say it's a master plan, it's a building, it comes with this historically conditioned notion of scale. And our, as an architect, we have to function sort of in this nonlinear way in multiple realms, et cetera, et cetera. So come up with the most generic logos possible. And um, so again, I went back at this opportunity. And so again, if you saw this at my interview last year, I apologize, but to quote Professor Sonnen, that information is built on strands of redundancy or bands of redundancy, which he's paraphrasing Roberto Echo, but I'm quoting you. <laughs> um, the, again, it goes back to sort of my, my original education was, you know, the fundamental critique on the market economy is when beings, subjects, are sort of separated from their objects. I noticed this in profession, especially when I was working at, say, SOM, that you had a, a technical architect, a design architect, a managing architect, and then et cetera, et cetera. And this is just a method of for, sort of divide and conquer. As long as the partner was the only one that really knew the whole process, they could reduce us to labor, right? We're not informed in the process. So this is what the notion of totality, when subject and object become one. So I wanted to adjust this through education. So the notion of alienation through Marx, which is this sort of critique of Hegel's notion, is that through the, we're, 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 we're disconnected from the producing of a product, the selling of a product, the thinking of a project, and the organizing of a project. That architecture, we have simply, firms like SOM have instrumentalized it to reduce labor to insignificant portions of a small fraction of an overall idea. But at the same time, like, when I was working and when I talked to my friends, we all had this anxiety, right? This, this, Ugh, I'm unhappy, I don't know why, et cetera, et cetera. And this is precisely what alienation is. It's where, like, you know, dread and nausea, et cetera. So we said, how can we do this? So this notion of alienation was at the core of my, I think, when I began to write this curriculum uh, for this chair. So how can we address that through architecture, specifically architecture education? 
And then, again, to quote Marx again, his 11th critique on uh, the thesis on Feuerbach, which I think is really the most important thing, and this is my maybe critique of architectural theory and the way I hear architectural discourse in this university, is that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. We've got to bring the fight to the ground. Like, I don't give a damn what the Deleuze's notion of space informs the floor plan. I care about labor, I care about inequality, I care about infrastructure, I care about public space, et cetera, et cetera. But I also don't know, you can't do it with a building. You're like, oh, I'm gonna solve like, women's suffrage with like, this kiosk, yeah, come on, that's nonsense. But the point of theory, the point of philosophy is to change you, not to change the world. You change yourself and then little things, just not being a jerk at the grocery store, put your grocery cart back. To me, this is the measure of being. Right? It's these insignificant events which no one's watching. If you do it well then, then yeah, you're not a jerk. But anyone can be a make, be a make bold gesture. So you're probably thinking, how the hell does that have to do with architecture? So my point was, how do we make a theory for practice? I really wanted to liberate students from having to work for someone. How do we actually teach students to work for themselves? How do we help them develop methods? I, I don't care about almost the way anything looks, per se, to a certain degree, but I do care the ideology, the theory, the reasoning, the thinking, the, the, the argument behind it, right? And, because um, I have my own personal taste, it's, it's quite good, but, <laughs> but I don't want to teach that, because that's mine. I don't want to make my little competitions here. And so, uh, I think this is what I was looking for, so I was searching for theory for practice. And this is something I was actually preparing, and I showed it yesterday, and I apologize, but the redundancy uh, and knowledge thing, now I can use this. Um, uh, should I prepare for this lecture I wanted to give in Moscow, but my visa got rejected. Um, it's the first sentence of, we must make our freedoms by cutting holes in the fabric of this reality, by forging new realities which will in turn fashion us. It's these little moments. I think the base, the base criteria for any education, any project, any writing, is to change reality. Right? Change the notion of what's equal, what's not fair, etc., etc. If you don't do this as an architect, then it's purely, purely labor. Right? Because I think this is my own interpretation that theory without practice is rhetoric and practice without theory is labor. Historically, these two words are indistinguishable. You could not separate them. And there's a theory for everything. And by making also, I mean writing, I mean teaching, I mean installations. I don't just mean making buildings. Everything is making. Right? Words critique, et cetera, et cetera. So but what I came is product of my office. And again, without teaching in two, starting in 2011, I don't start my office because I needed this sort of critical distance from practice to sort of evaluate it. So that, like last year, I took a year off from teaching so I could have a critical distance and evaluate my, my teaching. So I emailed old students, I went around and interviewed professors at different schools, trying to sort of, how do I adjust this? So the first thing is to simply listen. As obvious as this is, we don't listen. We want to impose, we want to hear what we want to hear, but listen visually, acoustically, materialistically, obviously listening, but just listen to things. See the problem is the problem. How we see a problem is necessarily a problem. So instead of seeing this sewage pipe, and I use this example maybe too many times, as a problem, but the way we see the sewage pipe is a problem. So when we look at sort of flooding, we're like, oh, let's use more infrastructure. No, infrastructure is the reason we have flooding. So we, first and foremost, have to sort of take this sort of almost like this, um, this, this sort of like this opposition to our own intuition, right? This sort of like this critical examination of what we assume to think. So seeing the problem. Next is this method we call unpacking. And you have to do this at every single scale and just take everything apart. Like when I was a kid, I'd always take my hamburger apart, right? And then try to uh, put it back. It would never be nearly as good. But I think this taking things back, and so it's not about the principles necessarily, but the elements which define the principles. And this is what Richard Feynman, this physicist from Caltech, was always teaching, that we have to teach the smallest things that make up the bigger things. And that's where we'll find the change. That's where we'll cut the holes in the fabric of reality. The next is we have to reject the notion of experts. Like they, you guys asked me this last year when I interviewed, and I thought for sure I wouldn't get the job. I'm like, I won't be an expert. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want, this is a prejudice to me. It's a, it's a knowledge, knowledge is a form of prejudice. Right? I know this, I'm an expert, I'm gonna impose this on you. Yeah, this is pure nonsense. I think we all have to function like, you know, Jürgen Habermas, that, you know, in the process of an enlightenment, there can only be participants, right? Which means that we're, we're all students. Um, surrender to the existing, don't see it as a problem, but just give into what's there. And then uh, doubt of self, this kind of comes back to that. So these are the sort of the ethos, I think, the, the principles which I sort of use to sort of create the curriculum. There is no author. I hate when students say, I want this, I like this. There is no self. There is no I. You know, that we're a collective. Everything I've seen and done is a collage from everyone I've ever met. You know, you can never cross the same river twice type of thing.
So don't ever say the word I. So we outlawed this in the chair. You couldn't say I. If you said I, you wouldn't get the review. Um, a new language, I think language is important that we have to, again, like this sort of notion of architecture or self. So many words already come historically loaded. Like I was in the first year reviews and someone said window, like come on. Like you're done then. You've already reduced it to an architectural element that's so predictable and generic. But maybe think about like uh, transparency or translucency. Think about the qualities that you want and not necessarily the, the element that you want. And then the most important thing is simply to begin. That's it. Like this is the thing with students, just begin. So, in a very Nietzschean-like way, I'm going to end with the beginning. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for the presentations. Um, next, Posit has a series of curated questions about writing and discourse for the two of you. Professor Sanin will be moderating in that he'll interject when he thinks it's necessary to explain further or to ask further questions. So the first question we have for both of you. Okay, so um, this conversation is focused on the two of you and your written work, especially in architectural discourse. What is your relationship between writing and design? I guess, I mean, I write, I like writing because it, I like tech, as you notice, I, I move too fast. So I like, I like process that, I like process that slow me down. So I work with materials like resin, or very, like materials that I have to give into them, right? And so writing slows me down. Like there is no like better software for writing, right? We all have to use the same words. And it's very humbling. So I like things that sort of force me to be clear. So I can't not, like, and also with having it in an office, like once I sketch something, it's dead. And the team interprets that as an idea. But if I write, say, a scenario, what we're doing with uh, Brian and Amber, where we sort of, create these sort of narratives. Then it becomes, architecture has to be interpreted. So that for me is a method of, I think, thinking, but it's not so much, say, about design, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a little bit about something you said um, towards the beginning of your talk, where you were saying that a, a lot of your writing was just kind of for yourself, right? And I think like, you know, just the, the way my kind of life arc has gone. Like when I was a designer, I wasn't writing things for a mass audience, I was writing it for myself. So that wasn't discourse, because there was no debate. I mean, I was debating with myself, I guess, right? Um, and, but, but it's incredibly important. I mean, all the, all the other things that I kind of pointed out about being like uh, incredibly clear about what your aims are, um, what your kind of um, ambitions are. I mean, I think, I think that that, that um, allows you to, um, it's a translation process. So, so in other words, that you, can, that, that you can kind of like work out of your design and kind of discuss it with others. You can, you can, uh, you can conceptualize it to yourself. I mean, I think that, that kind of verbalizing that stuff is incredibly important. Because if you're, if you're merely in the kind of state of kind of, a, a, kind of an auto, a autopilot, um, it, it tends to like not go anywhere. That, that's what I find. So it, so it gives a, it gives a kind of direction to the project. Um, yeah. uh, just to repeat what's been said, I think it's great that you guys are creating this forum. This is space for discussion. And it would be great that it is not just two positions side by side, but I would like to have a, a cage. <laughs> You know, with some rules and because uh, I think it's really important in a moment where architectural uh, both practice has become such a multifaceted possibility of how we act in the world and you both are, are examples of that, you come from philosophy into architecture, from architecture into writing and history and theory uh, and it's, it seems to me that, you know, it is important to be polite but it's also important to be able to come forward with the differences because I think there, there is a, there's a real space of uh, where we enrich each other, where we can really confront different perspectives. So, you know, even words that uh, seem very familiar to all of us, like theory or writing, and, you know, so I'm not sure, for instance, if we're using the word writing uh, as a sort of polite way to talk about theory, or if it's really a sort of theoretical uh, self-help 
uh, <laughs> idea of how confused I am with the world. Uh, is it instrumental? Is there, should there be a relationship between that moment of clarity and the tools I use and deploy at the moment of designing and transforming the world? Or is theory in itself transformative? I mean, there, there are a series of questions for in your practice about, you know, identifying these three personas, but I'm sure you're not as schizophrenic as all that. You know, it's not like there are two, two show, Joes uh, walking around the world. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the same as the other manifestations, and, but, you know, it would be interesting to understand that the, the work project, again, is confused with kind of a contract and assignment, right. uh, some kind of job that is given to you as opposed to a, a, an intellectual project, something that's equal to the world, vis-a-vis -vis the problem to identify as relevant and how you deploy certain techniques, uh, establish certain values, and, and create partnerships or, or develop tools and instruments to be able to confront that or to, or to position yourself there. So that's like an open like to respond to that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I have an issue with architecture theory, per se, not with you. But I think architecture theory, and this is, no, 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 but I think theory in general is sort of, it's, there's, everything is a theory, there is no theory, right? It's a small T, it's not a big T. And so I think often there's, sometimes I don't think there's a clear enough distinction between history and theory, right? Because they are they are different. And, and like when I taught theory at Delft, I taught, a, I, started, I taught a survey course in theory, right? So we begin with, say, necessarily with Kant, right? The, the first time the human being doubted consciousness, sorry. And so I think the architecture theory that I've seen so far in the States is that it's really one theory, but it's presented as theory, right? And instead of being more honest about, say, our, our, our sources, like the fact that most people are sort of referring to like the Frankfurt School or, you know, um, different sort of, you know, 20th century sort of theorists, and also understand the distinction between philosophy and theory, right? Th theory allows for failure, philosophy typically did not. So I think architecture theorists have to teach it more honestly. Talk about who you read to come to these conclusions. So then you, students, we have to enable students, not give students things. You know, what were the things I read that allowed me to come to a discussion, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that was, I mean, I think it's different here, and I, hopefully it's different here. But I know at other schools I've been, I've seen, like, theory is taught, yeah. And I don't like the instrumentalization of theory. That has to lead to a project. It has to lead to something. This is super nonsense, I think. You know, like, oh, I read Foucault, I'm going to do a prison, that's Panopticon. Like, no, you missed the whole point. You know, so, has that helped? Yeah, I mean, um, it's funny. I, I, I feel as though I can, um, you know, use what you said to kind of, like, support, support a, a point that I'm going to make, but, but also use something that you said earlier to, I don't know, take, take it in a different direction. So on the one hand, you, the... Yeah, I mean, that's all we're supposed to do, right? Because I hate you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, the I think I'll start with like kind of what you said and the, the, your your idea of like the no experts, right? You know, I'm, I'm coming from Berkeley, right? And so, like on the one hand, I say, yeah, right, right, no experts, right? Kind of um, uh, bottom-up organization, you know, like this this is great. Anyone can theorize, anyone can write history, anyone can be an architect. Um, you know, the, the kind of person on the kind of local community board is just as kind of, you know, you know that, that equalization, you have, to, you have to kind of really, on the one hand, you're like, yeah, yeah, like, I look at Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses, I'm obviously on Jane Jacobs' side, you know, like, she's, she's social justice, mm -hmm. she's president, mm -hmm. you know, like, this is good, right? Right. But, but then you're like, yeah, but you're in an architecture school, you're, you're in a professional degree program, you're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for I, so presumably some kind of expertise, right? So, like, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going in the direction where I'm going to be like, hey, see, I'm a theorist, so, <laughs> and I'm an expert. In fact, the opposite, because this is where I go the other way on this, is that, uh, that yes, I think, yeah, histor historians and theorists are, like, different, and, you know, maybe different than, like, someone that might be called a kind of practitioner, right? But I also... I also feel uncomfortable, like when I go, you know, it, it's that, um, it's that performance, like it, it, it's like not being schizophrenic, it's me like fitting into certain groups, so if I go to a, a history conference, I'm like, oh, all right, this is how you're supposed to, because yeah. this is what, you know, you're not allowed to theorize here, because that's, that's um, you know, that doesn't have evidence, that doesn't have, you know, all this like kind of weird stuff, like you can't point to, 
you know, the, the historical fact that says that. Um, and then the same with the kind of theory crowd, where it's just a kind of, you know, by contrast, it seems like a kind of free for all, um, <laughs> and you know, like very, very good with kind of language and things. But you know, we don't use like history because we're like future oriented. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like you know, we're speculators, right? And and that's our expertise. And so like when when expertise gets turned in that way, it, it's kind of gross, no, right? No, no, no. But but if it's it, as a kind of practitioner, I think you got to at least embrace some some ability or like recognize some sense that you're you're an expert or, or an expert at um, um, collaborating with people and like maybe getting their feedback. Sure, sure, like that. But but that's different than uh, you know there are no experts there. Yeah, uh, yeah I just respond quickly to this. I mean, I think quickly. Shortly, shortly, yeah. I, I think the expert notion is, I know, I mean, it's, it's, it is, it's, it's a loaded word, and it's precisely for that reason. I believe in experience, and I believe in professionalism, and I believe in, say, I think it's the mindset of the person that is the expert, right? Like, it's that you can't assume that you know everything about this thing. I mean, I'm specifically talking about problems I had with, like, structural engineers from Switzerland when we were doing this project in Spain. Like, oh yeah, we'll just get robots and we'll pump it up. I'm like, oh, no, 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 it's like, it's a Catalonia, like they want to use their own concrete. Can you tell us how to do this with this formwork? No, but it's a big deal, those robots, we can pour it like that. I'm like, no, I, I know you. And he's like, but we're the experts in like concrete in Europe. I'm like, yeah, but you just sound like an idiot, man. Like, this is not going to work here. So I think my notion of experts really derived from a more professional, of this sort of really, no offense, like white colonist male going somewhere and solving everyone's problems. Like, we know what to do. We're going to build like, dams here and help you and then totally wipe out a civilization. <laughs> right? So I, I think this notion of expert, I mean, I agree that there has to be qualifications and foundations, et cetera, et cetera. But you can never let yourself think that you're an expert. I mean, in the bottom of what you're saying, it's, it's, it's an issue of power. Yeah. It's a power structure that gives authority through some power of either institutional or social or economic position, whether it's a degree of yeah, a job description, a position in a corporation, or otherwise that allows you to claim certain knowledge. But for me, there's, there's another, and clearly I'm, I'm the old guy here, so I use very old words, you know, but this issue of expertise also brings the, the difference between what we call the profession and what we call the discipline. Because I think mm -hmm. that we tend to equate the two of them, and in a way, if we talk about the profession, I'm not sure that I like to talk about the theory of the, the profession of theorist as opposed to the theory of the discipline of architecture. Uh, and in that sense, for instance, the same activity look under those two lenses might bring to very different conditions because the profession is subjected to uh, scrutiny, uh, legislation, you know, certification, and otherwise. It is something that is engaged in the practice. It, it is re really reliable. The same activity seen under the, the, the virtue of the discipline begins to look at design not as an, uh, as an instrument, but as a, as a tool of research. So it's a, it produces knowledge. It doesn't only produce buildings, it produces knowledge. So for me, the, this distinction between theory, between theory and practice is less interesting. For me, probably mm -hmm. the, the idea of profession and discipline as in terms of both action, effect, and knowledge seems to be more productive. So I would like to that. Yeah. I think we have to take the more positive questions though now. I think there, I, get, I get the so, sense yeah. from that that we're not. Yeah, we gotta let's, <laughs> let's, let's rifle through these uh, highly thought out. Okay, questions. so the next question um, you guys have already started to touch on, but if you want to add more to it, what role do you believe writing or theory plays in architectural education? Do you believe it could be better cultivated or utilized, especially within the studio setting? And if so, how? Uh, I mean, quickly, I just think yeah. we have to remove those courses from architecture focus teach writing, teach literature, teach theory on it in and of itself. As soon as we attach architecture to it, it becomes instrumental. And these are the foundation courses of being. Like, I don't think you can be a human being without this sort of, this experience. I mean, and you can't, to me it's more important that we make you human beings and then you become an architect. So I think we have to teach these things liberated from the, sort of the institutional demand of an architectural education. No, I mean, I, I, I think that's about right. I, I think that, um, I think that writing should be part of any, like, you know, it is a professional program, right? And it's like, uh, there's a kind of disciplinary identity to it, all this other kind of stuff. However, uh, you know, some have argued that, like, architecture is one of the last kind of humanistic um, 
kind of endeavors, like in the way that, that, that you are, are merging the kind of, the, I don't know, I'm, I'm getting horrible with terms here, but the, the abstract and the technical, or the like ability, you know, like um, big ideas and, and, and small ideas, right? Um, I think that, that it's incredibly important, right? Like, so you, you should like know how to write. Like, that, yes. I mean, that's, that's crazy. Yes, that's, that's really crazy. I think like the, the fact that you're kind of in a, in a university um, also is something that should be like kind of taken advantage of. Um, I don't I don't know if it necessarily needs to be like totally like you know you, you it has to be like like theory can't be a kind of architecture theory it's, it's just a way of kind of like focusing it um, sure kind of still talk about big ideas learn learn how to craft an argument learn how to like use language like that yeah that's like incredibly important um, also the, the idea that like writing it isn't just to prepare like um, you know future academics or something I mean you even in, in practice, like in the profession, right? Like you need to know how to, to write, even if it's an email to a client. Um, so, so I think that that's like incredibly important. I think it does, like, you, you're, you're, the part about like how do you integrate into studio is a tough one. Because, um, you know, you always get these kind of um, kind of awkward paragraphs on like the first page of an assignment, you know? that no one ever reads, and it's like, because as a reviewer, you go up to it, and you're like, oh my god, it's, it's garbage, you know, it's, it's, it's like horrible writing, I'm not even going to engage that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that, there, there could be more of an effort there. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that that, that would, would uh, destroy a project or, or, or take away from uh, a kind of studio effort in any way. It's also not something that needs to happen like in the studio, I mean, like you could go home and you could kind of like reflect on your project and keep updating that paragraph. So it's not this uh, last minute, you know, you know, the, the plots are coming out of the machine and you're typing up some crap that no one's ever going to read. And we like read it when we do NAB and it's very awkward. Yeah, so yeah, more can be done there. I agree. Great. <laughs> Okay, so our next question is, um, you both participated in architectural biennales, which are essentially massive architectural collaboration. Can you speak on your ex um, respective experiences and the importance of biennales in terms of participating in them or just seeing them in general? I'll start with this. I, I super hate that stuff. I'm not doing it anymore. The stuff from Frenchel, like just like ego shows for a super privileged, detached audience. Like I feel that like this is just like who has the best food and who has the best foods. Yeah, this is such a waste of effort and money, and um, it's just no one looking at stuff, and I want to stay away from large gatherings of architects in the future. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> and with that, I'll leave. <laughs> no, and I mean, I, here we're, we're doing stuff. We're, we're thinking, we're making, we're creating, and there's, those are just like, just like yeah, horse and pony shows. And, the, the stuff is, and then this theory is attached to nonsense. And, and it's just like, I had such an unpleasant experience. I mean, I don't know, I like what we did, it's super nice, but I also know it's artificial and shallow, and it looked way more important than it really was. And I just think there's better things we should be doing with our effort and time, and especially, and I hate that we look at this stuff and not the other stuff that other people are doing. That's far more relevant, you know, and far more, I think, important. So, I'm personally, I think you should go and see them, for sure, especially when you're young, and if you get the opportunity to do it, but after you do one, it's like one and done, like the NCAA college athlete. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I had fun. I had fun. <laughs> I made like the best models I've ever made in my life. Um, it's a kind of collaborative thing. I, I mean, the project, it's funny, the, the, the foam core spray painted models were better than the real project. Um, it was the, the Eyes in Spain project. Um, but, but, I, but I hear your kind of point on that. Um, actually, it, it's funny that you say that, because the, the last uh, um, ACSA thing was based on this idea of Detroit as a kind of um, test bed of, of design and things. And I was like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't write about Detroit. I don't, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> but uh, you know, you got to still submit to this thing. So I'm like, OK, what do I, what do I got in the bank here? Um, and, I, and I realized, like reading the literature about this stuff, that I'm like, wow, the, the, particularly with the Detroit focus, and it being in Venice is this kind of like weird speculative thing. 
I'm like, this is it, like, because uh, again, like my, my like, dissertation on this like stuff is about colonial, post-colonial yeah. conditions. Um, and, a, and a critical part of that representation was really like the colonial exhibitions. Mm -hmm. And I felt as though, like the title of the article was, was uh, Detroit Colony. Because yeah. it really was like, look, we went to this crazy place yeah. called America. Yeah. And we found this like beat up you know, yeah. natives. Yeah. And um, let's, let's put them on display. I, I, um, and, and show them off in the kind of gallery in the gallery setting, I, um, to, I, I, and, it, and it creates this stark divide, you know, like the all of these like horrible um, colonial um, uh, setups. So I mean, maybe it was a bit of a stretch, but like I, it was super disgusting. It was pure autism. Yeah. That, that, that was this, also this bunch of architects in this country right now. I just I hate. I'm not sorry. I promised my friend I wouldn't insult anyone, but um, sorry. it was autistic that Detroit thing. The, it's interesting because I think someone you work. You work on the joint in Venice. No, I didn't. Okay. I, yeah. I, I did Venice years first. in in a previous life, and I had nothing to do with Detroit. Just a critique. Okay. I, right now, the, I think they say there's about one Biennale in the world a week. Right. I mean, there are like two hundred and seventy Biennales going on in the world. So something that has started as a, as an idea to bring together you know, relevant issues and, and players from all over the world has become marketplace. Clearly, it is it is become a marketplace. And uh, on the other hand, I was always interested in how to take institutions that apparently or realistically have deteriorated so much and, and how they can become something else. In 2011, for instance, where I was invited to design, to be the designer of the whole installation of the Kwanju Biennale in Korea, and the director was, uh, I went away, the artist and, and Sung Kyo Sang. Um, for instance, one of the simple things that we did to, to challenge this issue was they had a big budget to booze and party all over the world, basically. <laughs> right? So we turned it into an academy. We were around the world, but we were actually working on creating forums and discussion of relevant issues. Because right? as mm -hmm. you know, I went away somebody who's very committed in, in the politics of, 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 of these things. And it, it began to create a, a sort of culture that now we're also trying to explain, exploring that. So I, I guess I'm defending because I'm participating in the, in the Seoul Biennale this year. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're also, lo also looking at, at how the Seoul Biennale, which is the first Biennale, can be not simply a marketplace, but actually a mechanism to construct relationships and collaborations that actually leave a permanent mark in the city. So in, in, in two weeks, actually, we're going to, okay. we're having a forum on by city architects trying to to create a network of city architects in different cities around the world to construct uh, sort of some kind of collaboration. So I agree with you, but I think it's also important for us to critically engage some, some of these institutions and see how we can reframe them and redefine them uh, and find some kind of effect. But I, I, mean, the, I think we're grossly over and we're ignoring questions, but we're just going to keep going right now. Um, I agree, but these things were born out of sort of a, a movement, right, of a, of a need or desire. Now they become institutionalized and become sort of, I mean, Rolex sponsored REMS and he had to do this discussion with the paint manufacturer and they're like, like why do architects wear black? Like, it's like REMS in this Venice, yeah. So I mean, the, 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 they've, they've been degraded. So what I like now is what you, I mean, you guys just start your own stuff. You don't need the Venice Biennale, you don't need the Chicago Biennale, like, come on, do it. Like this is a good example of it. Like create, you know, there's a need now. And, and you guys are a hell of a lot more organized than we were. So do your own Biennales. Don't call them Biennales. Or do them where people actually can see them, you know? Great. Next closet event. Um, <laughs> um, so our last question. pressing everybody? So our last question from Posit um, pertains particularly to Posit and the work we do with multimedia platforms. So we'd like to ask you, um, as we ask all our interviewees and participants, how has social media impacted the way you work, the way you share your work, and the way you study the work of others? I mean, I love social media. I'm, I'm like a 13-year-old you know, boy with low self-esteem, you know, in terms of like, no, I'm sorry, but, uh, but, you know, in terms of like the interaction rates. But um, no, like we've been, like people have noticed our work on Instagram and we are invited to the exhibition in France because a curator saw a model we were making for an exhibition in Sao Paulo. So for us it's been instrumental because in a way it's, you get to sort of expand your sort of reach with, in a very uh, affordable way, you know, and it's also seen students liking your work. 
I think as an architect, I have two, say, um, audiences, students and, and, and clients. Other architects, I mean, uh, you know, my colleagues, but I don't want to impress other architects. Right? I, want to, I want students to see the value, the value in our work, and I want clients to hire us. So for me, social media has done that in a very effective and very affordable way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's good. It, you, you run into some kind of like real institutional issues. So for example, you know, as a, as a kind of professor, you need to kind of be in peer-reviewed peer journals and all this other stuff, which honestly most people don't have access to or don't take the time to like actually go access. Um, but it does like provoke a, like this weird moment of reflection where, you know, you know, you spend like a decade of your life like writing a dissertation, I think like, there's no way five people read that thing. I mean, <laughs> I, the, my advisor didn't even. So I mean, you're down to like maybe two, two people, right? Um, and, then, and then on the other hand, like I, I spent one day with Lori Brown and we put together this kind of thing for our daily and posted and it's like 3,500 likes, and it's like, oh my god, like what, th there's this weird kind of imbalance there where it's incredibly like great to kind of get out ideas, um, but uh, does it, do you, do you risk a kind of, um, I don't know, like a, like, a, like a deeper level of understanding in these things by, by like, by always like kind of playing to the, the, the surface. I mean, the same the same critiques with Biennale, right? Like, I mean, it, is is it just a kind of like new kind of surface market uh, I without mean, without much depth? I think that's what I think this is where we have to have more responsibility. Like, I do think it educate you can teach theory in an entertaining way. Like, you don't have to have a three hour lecture on Hegel that's just boring as hell, right? Like, I, I like John Oliver's show, right? Like, he can do these really important, dense complex issues in 20 minutes. And I think as an educator, we have to do that. So again, so it's more of a, like a you know, McClellan, the medium is the message. But actually now that we have this medium, more people like us have to use it to provide, I think, more content and more clarity and not simply reduce it to sort of this. So I encourage, like, we all have to use it more sophisticated and more, that's what's the word, sophisticated, yeah. Well, things are going much better for me since I hired this Russian troll farm. <laughs> Okay, it's that being said. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you are. So ended. unfortunately, because we had such a great conversation, we can't do all the questions that you guys submitted from social media. So we'll do one of the ones that we found a little bit more provocative and then move on to audience questions to agree with us. I so, heard Joseph's going to answer question, questions on Twitter after this. Oh. Right, Joseph? <laughs> we can definitely do that. <laughs> I mean, it's, this was nice. I, I don't know nice. So the question that we're going to ask from um, anonymously submitted deposit through social media is, what are your responsibilities in this profession and the school that still lacks representation of women, non-binary, queer, and people of color? Do you believe um, you have responsibilities? Yeah. <laughs> what was the question? I mean, not be a jerk? Um, Wait, so what are your responsibilities? Yes. Like, of course we have a response. Is that for us? Or that the yeah, audience? that's a, who submitted that question. No, that's a good question, because yeah. obviously, you know, it's, uh, it's not really a binary panel. Um, oh, there's me. No, I know. I mean, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what is the responsibility? I think it's, it comes back to the notion of perspective. Forcing people to understand that's just the way you look at it, right? And sort of like, you know, as in some of these reviews I've been in, right? I'm like a review junkie right now. I can't get enough. And so it's about the, the lenses in which we examine work and that try a different lens. Look at what, what do you, who do you think is, you're looking at from your lens and that's maybe a male-dominated lens. So have you actually thought about it from these different lenses? So I think as an educator and with the colleagues and everyone is just forcing them to understand there's infinite lenses in which we examine things. And understanding this then understands that, okay, that's, I'm kind of being an asshole. You know, like, it's like I'm being a jerk by assuming this is the one lens that's the dominant lens. So I think I try to do that as much as I can, but I'm sure I can be better at it. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that that's, uh, you know, if I, if I think of my theory course, like, there's, there's, a, there's definitely uh, a, an effort to rep be uh, inclusive, right? To, to try to uh, turn away from the kind of, like, uh, normative um, standard about like where where voice comes from, right? Um, 
I don't think it's something that you you necessarily need to um, you know like throw out all the the previous literature. Um, I think that that um, it's actually quite helpful to like read things that are actually quite standard and then and then question them. So like you know like. Oh sure, Vitruvius. You you read that kind of an intro class, right? And then there's like the parts that you need to like just know as a kind of architect. But then you're like, look at this paragraph, and there's like all this stuff about like capturing slave women and and, and uh, you know well, the, the kind of like the, the the savage Persians and all. You know, it's like what you know what what's this? Like what you, you got to kind of read through that and understand that as a kind of uh, that that the foundations are creaky. You know, that it's not like, the, the foundations aren't there to like prop, prop us up, but, but rather to kind of understand how, how leaky that is. Um, and then on top of it, obviously, it's like that people have been talking about the built environment, you know, of, of all different kind of persuasion throughout history, um, including their, their input and part of the discussion, I think, is, is as um, and maybe I yeah, can follow yeah, up yeah. quickly with that because I, I think it's true we can't dismiss the canons but the way we teach them so I had a course was the introduction to literary theory right and we use the same text and use different methods of literary critique to examine that text structuralist, post-structuralist, colonial, post-colonial feminist, post-feminist, etc, cetera, etc cetera. and what you see is that there's infinite interpretations to a book and, and having that data allows you to see really how wrong or gross or prejudiced certain societies have been so I think it's also the way we use states theory in the office is trying to find different methods of critique of a project. So I think it's, I think it's exactly right. You have to use a book, but then multiple lenses with that one book. Great. Um, so now we'll take questions from the audience. If you want to raise your hand, I'll come and give the microphone to you. If there are any questions, great. Hi, guys. Uh, Thank, thanks, guys. Thanks for both your presentations. And, um, you know, in, in many ways, I think that you're both kind of like who I want to be when I grow up. There, there's, um, that, seriously, higher, man. no, seriously, <laughs> like, um, because there, there, are cert there are certain presentations that piss me off because I completely disagree with how unrigorous all this stuff is and it just kind of leaves me angry. And there are other ones that, that piss me off because, like, why am I not doing, you know, why am I not doing that? Um, and this kind of fits in the letter. Um, and, uh, but uh, the question is more about like um, uh, how we, when we have these really um, visceral disagreements with the kind of structure of the profession and the discipline that we are, that we, that we um, uh, subscribe to, um, uh, how do we, um, how, you know, and, and this is something that I grapple with myself, like, like how do you really, um, Create that change from the inside, without just saying saying fuck it and just like I, I just want to do it from somewhere else, from a completely different position. Instead of and, and it comes back to part of these the, the canon questions. Do we have to like accept these canons and, and read them and read them in these opposite ways, or do we want to start creating completely new canons or completely new references and, and just say I, I, I you know throw away the rest of it. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for the kind words. It's very humbling, and thank you. But I think, I, I think you can't throw away knowledge. Like, you just have to understand it and place it and critique it. And you, no one, you're not, you don't know you're in a revolution while you're in a revolution, right? Only historically when you examine it. So you don't know you're writing a canon. You're like, oh yeah, I mean, this book's going to be remembered forever. I mean, if you do that, you've got some serious ego issues. Um, so I think it's impossible to say new canons. Of course we'll make new canons, and of course, but that takes time. It's kind of why I hate architectural awards. You can't measure the value of a building in one year. It takes, I think, minimum 20 years to give a building an award. It's super nonsense. Um, so in terms of like discourse, I think it gets like, you know, it's like, it's like the, the revolution ha won't be televised meant that it happens within you. Right? The revolution, first and foremost, has to happen within you. And, and so when this discourse and this disagreement, I think you start by questioning yourself, going within you, critiquing yourself. And then in an academic environment, we should allow for tension, we should allow for disagreement. But at the same time, there shouldn't be this expertise that, that I'm right, you're wrong. Because I think we, the discourse and the tension is fundamental to evolve the profession. And I think people simply have to allow for it. And disagreements have to say, 
about content and not about and not personal. And I think once you go personal, you've you've lost. Yeah, I mean, I think um, kind of what I was saying in the previous uh, uh, response, I was I was trying to make an argument, I think, for kind of both and. So, so in other words, you, you, you kind of keep parts of the canon, but you critically read it, um, and then you, yeah, you don't like, I'm writing you the new canon, right? But you, 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 you layer on top of that uh, uh, different voices, like clearly different approaches, right? Um, and, and allow for that um, space to um, possibly turn into something, right? Like it's not, it's not gonna be an overnight um, kind of success. Um, it, in terms of like the, the, the issue of um, kind of critique and dealing with, with kind of difference, or like if you're like pissed off about something, it, I think that like like that stuff. I, I like the part about like being will, being willing to like uh, have the conviction to say you know this has to change, right? And like going going about it in a, in a systematic and not just a kind of like a, kind of like asshole kind yeah, of way. Like, um, um, but but then also understand that. That in that process, you you know you're not gonna like you're not gonna come up with some theory and be like you know I'm right and I just need to kind of pound it into these people's heads and then and then we'll be in a kind of an ideal society that that you have to like realize that you're gonna be you're gonna probably change that process um, and, and maybe have some of that other side um, in you by, by the end. I mean I I think about kind of how much like I've changed since I've even come here. Um, and it, and it, there's just there's 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 different elements to the to, to my even my, my language um, that that I don't I don't see as me like kind of like um, submitting to some some other kind of system but like saying like being selected you know I mean, well that that part's like not not bad but <laughs> so I, I, I I I completely agree it's like this you're different like I mean this. I think this notion of subject and object and the sort of European sort of modernity notion has always been wrong. I think there's a word in, say, Sanskrit, which is sunyata, which means continuous state of exfoliation or radical impermanence. I think as a human being, you have to constantly be questioning and evolving. I think it's, I mean, yeah, two years ago, I'm like, God, I was an idiot. I can't believe I thought this. And I think this is important. So I think when I get really discouraged when academics sort of draw this line in the sand, like I'm here, they're, I'm right, they're wrong, and, and maybe some of it's nice on a, on a, on a sort of a, a larger level, but when it really becomes purely about ideology, then I get concerned, because then it becomes a prejudice, or it's really they're clinging to that fear, because if they don't have that fear, they have nothing else. I think we have time for one more question, if there's one from the audience. If not, we can do one of social media questions. This is, yeah, you're 100% right. And this is kind of what you know, Francisco was saying about the, the power, the, the, the methods of power distribution. And it's, we have to sort of change those methods and the people determining what is the canon. So I, I completely agree. And I think, I don't know, I think it's, yeah, that's, that's, that's 100% correct. I mean, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, excellent point, And I definitely agree with it. It's also a great ending point. So pause it. We'd like to thank you for your participation. And everyone have a great Thursday.